Entrepreneur Circle is an On Air Brands production and a proud member of the On Air Brands Network. Hi, this is Robert Kiyosaki, and you're listening to Entrepreneur Circle with Eric Cabral. On this episode, I found that in marketing, there are two types of people there are artists and analysts. The artists are like, here's the shiny new thing. It's so beautiful. I'm more on the analyst side, which is like, does it work? I don't care what you do. I mean, let's come up with some ideas. Let's do it consistently and see if it works. I'm much more of an action execution person. You have now entered the entrepreneur circle. Hey there, folks. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Entrepreneur Circle podcast, where we inspire you by talking to entrepreneurs and business owners about mindset, goals, vision, tips and strategies on how to crush life and business. I am your host, Eric Cabral, real estate investor and a creative. I've been in the creative industry for over 20 years, got my start in New York City as a junior art director, and made my way up the corporate ladder to become the creative director at the number one pharma company in the world. That was until I decided to hang up my corporate hat and start my own creative agency called On Air Brands, where we broadcast your brand and your message using social media and live stream events. Hit us up at info at onairbrands.com to learn more. Also, like, subscribe, and share this podcast on social. We greatly appreciate you for it. And also don't hesitate to send us any feedback that you may have because we always love, love, love hearing from you. Before we jump into the show, I'd like to share what some of our sponsors, partners, and friends of the show have to offer you. Hey there, entrepreneurs. Eric Cabral here, founder of On Air Brands and host of the Entrepreneur Circle and Capital Hacking. I wanted to share something truly unique with you that we've created called Pod Max, which is an amazing opportunity to connect you with major podcasts to help you share your fascinating stories with their communities. This unique invitation only event includes interviews with you on top rated business podcasts all in one day. It also provides a unique networking opportunity with high performance guests and thought leaders who are authors, coaches, and consultants, investors, speakers, executives you name it. These are the type of people that you need to be around. We also provide industry expert keynotes to hit our stage to share insights on podcasting, investing, marketing to help you take things to the next level. And the cool thing about Podmax is that it has a multimedia agency engine behind it with on-air brands to provide social media promotions before and after the event to share your brand new shows with your network. So hit the apply now button at podmax.co and I hope to see you at the next Podmax event. Hey, folks, welcome back to the Entrepreneur Circle. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening and supporting. Please like, love, and subscribe to the show. Today, I have a wonderful, wonderful individual. She's really, really inspiring, and hopefully she will inspire you as she does me. Welcome, Becca Shea, to the show. Thank you so much. Hey, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we had some wonderful a lot conversation. What to live up to? Wonderful, <laughs> inspiring. <laughs> no, really, I've I've listened to your you you on other shows. Um, I've been following you somewhat recently, and um, I'm looking forward to your your talk um, at our real estate hackers conference coming soon. Nice. So yeah, a lot of really cool things happening with you and your life and your family. So a little primer for the folks at home who are listening. Uh, Becca is the CEO and founder of Market Shark, and she has a very extensive uh, resume here of experience. So she's rehab. She's been in real estate for over six years, rehabbing over 60 houses, wholesaling more than 120 deals. And prior to all of that real estate, she served as uh, an officer in the U.S. Navy um, and also spent seven years working as a mechanical engineer in the energy efficiency arena. Uh, She is a family gal through and through with three daughters. Much love to you in that because like we we were talking earlier, um, I have two. And I can't even imagine with three. Yeah, it, it would be pretty wild. I, I often <laughs> say it's like Lord of the Rings when I come home from work. Like, like there's mud on their faces and 
<laughs> he's like, they've taken over the village. And <laughs> so I can't even imagine. I hope you have a, you have a tighter rein on what's happening over there. But um, I just embrace it. I'm like, oh, yeah. this, it's a happy household. It's loud and dirty. Great. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's You just grow accustomed to it, right? It's... Mm -hmm. It's not noise anymore. I was actually talking to my oldest this morning and she was talking about, um, she's always screaming bloody murder and <laughs> I don't come running, right? Because it's all the time. You know, it could be the toilet paper roll is out, um, something like that. And she's screaming, but I, I, we have to tell her, don't be the boy who cried wolf, you know, because one day there's going to be a real accident and we're not going to come running. So that's a new sort of story. But anyway, <laughs> welcome Becca to the show. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, we're gonna have some fun. Awesome. Let's yeah. Do so, it. so I know I didn't touch on everything because you have a rich life, and I want to share that with the audience. So, tell us a little bit about you know your journey. What I usually like to say: uh, What was the bug that bit you and made you realize you know I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a business owner, and I'm gonna I'm gonna act as such. Mm, man, that's a great question. I made the leap from corporate America into real estate investing. So like my background's engineering, Navy officer. I am like a conservative risk taker, <laughs> if that makes sense. So um, I remember I was pregnant with my third daughter. I was traveling all the time. And I just wanted, I'd always wanted to rehab a house. I just loved the idea of it, right? But in a very tangible way, not in a like HGTV sort of way. <laughs> um, and so when I went on maternity leave, I said, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm just going to try this. I'm going to, I'm going to try to rehab a house. If it works well, then maybe luckily I was in a place financially where my husband could support our family. So like, I was like, if it works, then maybe I can do that. I can just kind of supplement our family income, but I can spend a lot of time with, at that point I had three daughters, five and under. Right. So I, I wanted to be around more, but I didn't want to be a stay at home mom. <laughs> Um, I'm just, I'm not fed up for that. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard being stay at home. Mom. Absolutely. I mean, I, you give me one day and I'm like, get me out of here. Pull the ripcord. I don't know how you do it. It's rough. It's like Groundhog Day over and over. There's oh like no God. tangible success or validation. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a very important and integral thing in life that we need to sort of shepherd the next generation to set them up with success. But like you said, Groundhog Day, every single day, your mind turns to mush because now you're, you're listening to stories and tellings and playing games and playing, for, you know, girls. I'm always like, you know, tea parties and dress up. And I'm like, my, I, I have all these things I have to do. I can't stop thinking as a business owner. Like, there's so much I have to do. So many emails. But yeah, yeah, you have to be present. And that's I struggle oh, every that, day. That's like. I sometimes think the hardest thing for me to do is to get down on the floor and play with my kids and shut my brain off. Like that's probably, that might be the hardest thing that I do some days. And I, I, I think that that's a lack in me, right? I think that's kind of a deficiency in, in who I am, but that's a, that's, I know it's a common struggle. So, <laughs> um, so that was my, my kind of when I left, engineering. That's what I did. But I always had that in the back of my mind. Like, I'm not going to lie. I wasn't like, I'm just going to jump off this cliff and build the plane on the way down. I was like, I'm going to jump off this cliff. And if it doesn't work, I'm actually, I'm just going to kind of crawl down the side of this cliff. And then if I don't like it, I can crawl back up. <laughs> so, so. Can, take us back to the day or the weeks where you were sort of mulling this over. You, you, so did you decide to leave corporate America? Like you put your two weeks in and you said, Hey, I'm going to do something else. Or for me, I got laid off. So it was back to the grind, put the resumes out there. I got job offers and it was like, do I say yes or no at this point? Cause I want to do something different. Mm -hmm. I, so how, what was your experience? And do you remember the, the fear or the anxiety during that time? I remember the conversation that made me make this decision. Like it was only a matter of time before it happened. Maternity leave happened to provide a um, nice break to, to do it. Um, but what had happened was a little bit before. So at the time I was, what's seven years ago? I was like 32, um, right? <laughs> Somewhere around then. <laughs> I don't know how old I am. And um, I was at this point in my corporate career where I had enough experience. I was getting some leadership. I had gotten tapped for this high level leadership program, like executive level. And I got to be 
uh, as part of this program, I got to be in a room with 14 CEOs of like major businesses like Otis Elevator, Pratt & Whitney, Sikorsky. And I'm, I'm having dinner one night, me and, and the 14, like they call this cohorts. And I always tell this story because it was so, it was just, it, to me, it was such a pivotal moment in my life. I looked around the room and I had my life laid out before me. You know, if I followed this path they're putting in front of me, I could potentially be one of these CEOs. And so then I started digging in to, uh, you and I talked before we came on this about balance being important to me. And I, they said, you can ask us any question. Nobody gets this opportunity. Like you guys are so lucky to be here. And I said, cool, cool. Um, I'm just curious, like how many, how many days last year did you guys travel? <laughs> and, and it was like 80 to 90% of their year they traveled, they were away from home. And so then I said, all right, I have a follow up question. How many of you are still married to the same person you were married to when you were like 30? Because these guys are all like 50 or 60. And only one of them was. That's a, that's a great bunch of questions. <laughs> and what's funny, I mean, did you think about that on the fly? Or did, were you like thinking about it I, before the meeting? I think it must have been percolating in my subconscious. Because um, I was a couple months into that program at that point. So I was like thinking about where this was taking me. Yeah. What's funny about that is some people who are listening in their cars or, you know, working from home or doing what you're doing as you listen to Becca's story is, um, you said 80 to 90% um, said they, they, you know, uh, the year they traveled. Not That's not in a good way. Like they're away from yeah. home, right? Yeah. On business trips, which is brutal. Yeah. 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 I, I totally resonate with that because the job offer I got it was either go to get into real estate investing or go back to corporate America. And it was going to require a ton of me not being home. And at the time my wife was pregnant. So I was like, Oh my God, imagine if I'm away when that happens. So anyway, yeah, yeah I, I really, I, mean, I, you know what? I had already um, really been down that path because of my military experience. Like I, I had a Navy ROTC scholarship, I got in, I served my four years. And when it came time to, re, you know, like renew or decide if I was going to continue on this path, I really thought about what was important to me. And so this was in my twenties, right? I'd already had one round of this. And I remember thinking my husband and I, same thing. We were about to have, we'd been married for a little bit and we were thinking about kids. And I was like, I don't want to go back to sea 30 days after I, at the time, that's what the policy was. Like you, if you were on a sea tour, you could go back to sea 30 days after you had a baby. And I was like, I just don't want to do that. It's just not the life I want. So that it kind of came back around with the leadership thing in the corporate America, but it had been a common theme. Gotcha. Gotcha. So I'm curious because I, I've, I've spoken to a lot of, of military folks who are, are active or, or not. And, and, and they're, they make some of the ama most amazing real estate investors um, because you know, same thing with like Keller Williams or Cutco folks. Like I've noticed a pattern of certain individuals that come from a specific type of training and, and discipline that allows you to become this successful investor. So what are some of the things that when you were going through those programs and you were learning leadership and, and you know, teamwork and all of those wonderful things, when did you start to realize I, I could take this and this and both these together and, and my and my superpower and I'm just going to like, how did, how did you sort of formulate all of that and realize, yeah, I'm going to use this as rocket fuel. I think the thing that the military does exceptionally well is um, they, they raise leaders, whether you're an officer or an enlisted, they really promote leadership. And one of the ways that they do that is, um, you know, in, in America today, we live very sheltered lives. Like the, the things that we consider catastrophes are really not <laughs> right. Um, and in the military, the, the things that we consider catastrophes are catastrophes. So there's this kind of perception, like this shift of knowing what the worst that could happen is like, especially if you've been in the military, you really, you've considered at some point that you might die or someone next to you might die. And that's kind of the worst that could happen. So a lot of things now, even the hardest decisions, you know, losing a lot of money or whatever, I'm healthy, I'm alive, I'm not dead. <laughs> Like the perspective, I think, is part of what makes military people. Yeah, a hundred percent. So jumps. yeah, I love that, and 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 thank you for sharing that because you're absolutely right. The perspective um, sort of breeds, you know, uh, you know, being grateful and appreciative of what you have because 
as you know, most Americans, we take this for granted. We take all of the privileges and all of the things that we have at our fingertips for granted. And th that's a really good point. You know, when you come up through uh, something like that, you're you're really aware because you see it all around you and it's constantly in conversations, I imagine. Um, so w what would you find that from that experience going into corporate America, were you able to sort of say, this is my skill set and this is how I can help this organization. And when you made the transition to corporate America, was it still in your mind? Was there inklings of Becca, the entrepreneur, the real estate investor, any no. interest in it at all? Wow. Yeah. I, I never thought I would be an entrepreneur. Um, I, when I left the military, I didn't know where I was going to go. Um, I, when I went into the military, I thought I was going to be a pilot. And so that was going to kind of define my journey. I mean, so that's, that was like 18, 19 years old. Like I'm, I'm going in, I had a pilot slot. I went to flight school, like I'm going to be a pilot and that'll be the next 20 years of my life. And then my eyesight disqualified me. So I ended up set, serving my four years and then I got out and I was like, well now what? Okay. Well, I guess I have this engineering degree. I'll, I'll do that. Um, and then I, I, I did that for like six or seven years, seven years. And I don't know. I think just what I really do think it was that whole leadership journey of thinking about, is this what I want? Like when I look at the next 20 years, is this what I want? And it, it wasn't. And I wanted to be the master of my own destiny. And like, I have this rule, no matter what job you're doing, you should love your job 75% of the time. Like 25%, you're just going to have bad days. It, no doubt. Right. But like 75% of the time, you should get up and feel like I'm good at what I do. I like what I do. Um, and, and it's a good place to be. And I think you can find that in corporate America and outside of corporate America. So I wasn't finding that in corporate America anymore. So the natural thing was what comes next. Right, right. So the decision to jump into real estate, <clears throat> how, how did that come about? What were sort of the catalysts for the, that decision? Um, I, <laughs> I'd always wanted to do it. My husband and I are both very handy. Like we're the type of couple that instead of going out on the weekend, we'll build something at our house. Like that's, that makes us happy. It's our thing we do together. And so we had always talked about flipping a house and I was like, okay, we have three kids. We both have two full-time jobs. Like flipping a house is another job. That's essentially three full-time jobs. <laughs> <laughs> And so when the opportunity presented itself that, hey, I could like step away for a year, flip a house, try it out, uh, and, and just do flipping and parenting, um, that's, that was what made that decision for me. And I, I just love the idea. Like I've always been a big thinker, like a visionary person. Like I, I'm sure a lot of rehabbers can relate to this. I can walk into a house. I love every house. Every house I love. Cat pee and, and all. Yeah, cat pee, hoarder <laughs> houses, hole in the roof, mold. Yeah. I love them. That's amazing. Because when I walk in, I see it as it can be. And so. That's a gift, really. Yeah. And I, I like, I just, I love, I have so much joy and passion for that. Um, and, and so it, it felt, it felt like a gift to be able to take the maternity leave and go do that thing that I'd always wanted to do. So. Yeah, I can imagine how exciting that must have been. Um, so what type of, you know, as as humans, we, we, we tend to shift or gravitate towards things that make us comfortable, uh, mm -hmm. things that make us feel safe. So I imagine um, that you were educating or surrounding yourself with people during that time to get you to the point where you felt comfortable enough to pull the trigger and actually buy a home. So what were you doing? you know, from the networking educational side of things? Sure. I think I started the same place a lot of people start, um, bigger pockets. The, the first, that was like online, but actually the first thing that I remember reading that made me feel so comfortable, uh, I have a kind of a couple mentors on this journey. They don't know it. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> That's the only the way. Um, but Danny Johnson has a blog, Flipping Junkie, and he also is a former engineer, software engineer, and he had broken down every deal for, I think it was like 37 weeks. Every house he went to look at, he broke down the numbers. Every rehab he did, he broke down the numbers. And just seeing behind the curtain made me think, okay, I can do this. This is not crazy complicated. This is, and he had, everybody has to start somewhere. So I, I did, uh, I read his whole blog, like start to back. 
And then he had this like recommended resource list. And one of the resources that he said helped him get started in wholesaling was Ron Legrand. So then I went to one of Ron Legrand seminars and he sent all the course, like a bunch of his coursework, all the, at the time it was CDs and these like binders. And I ripped them all to MP3. And I remember I was like training for a marathon and I listened to them nonstop, like uh, lease options, ugly houses, rehabbing, wholesaling. I listened to every single one. I just ate it up. Uh, and then bigger pockets, of course. So that was kind of the things that got me into it. And then what, the catalyst for me buying my first house was I went to a local RIA. After I had done my research back in the comfort of my home, I actually decided to dip my toe into the local network, brought a friend, uh, and the friend and I ended up partnering up on our first house. Mm, wow, that's awesome. So your friend was someone that was sort of being inspired by you, heard you talking about it, or were were they doing their own research on the side or just relying yeah, on you? I don't think she had ever thought about flipping houses beforehand. I'm not sure. She might have told me at some point, but really she, she was my neighbor and um, she was between jobs. Uh, and I wanted to go to this meeting. My husband was home with, somebody had to stay home with the kids, right? But I was a little scared to go by myself. And so I just went over and I said, will you come to this real estate meeting with me? And we went and I remember, um, I lived in Safety Harbor down by Tampa at the time. And there's this beautiful bridge that connects Tampa to like Clearwater Beach. It's this long paradise bridge lined with palm trees. We were driving back across this bridge. And I remember looking at her after the meetup and saying, I can do this. And she said, I think I can too. And then we kind of like looked at each other and we're like, should we do it together? That's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. So cool. So she was really there as support and, you know, safety and numbers. And then all of a sudden that's your partner. It's your, your yeah. new business partner at the time. So, uh, take me back to that. I'm always curious about, because I, I, I often want the audience who wants to get into real estate or they're interested in becoming an entrepreneur and just pulling the trigger, leaving whatever corporate America. Um, what was it about, you know, do you remember, that time with the first house where you're like, okay, was it off the MLS or was it a, like a pocket listing or is it? Uh, we bought it from a wholesaler actually, which I don't even know that I, maybe I knew the term wholesaling at that point, but um, obviously not as savvy as I am now in this world. Um, he had bought it. It was like a, somebody had died. I think there were medical bills or some liens on it. So he bought it, cleared up the liens. I think uh, and I ended up buying it for like 49000 or 40000 I really need to know the numbers of this first deal better. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It was so long ago. But um, do you, so it was like around forty nine fifty thousand. And then how much work did it need? Um, we put in another forty, and we sold it for one thirty. dollars um, The only number that I know for sure from that deal is that we netted 38000 at the end of the day. Wow, wow, so, wow. I'm not sure if those numbers add up exactly, but I know that number for sure because I remember we both took our, you know, 16 or uh, whatever half of 38,000 is. Such yeah. a good engineer. <laughs> <laughs> so, and um, we took our money and we, we went our separate ways after that, which one of my pieces of advice for people is like, they're, they're worried about partnering because they don't know how it's going to go, right? And they're afraid. And I would say the best thing in any relationship, whether you're hiring a contractor or partnering up with someone is just put, put a short like timeline on it, an evaluation period. So she and I, we basically said, we'll flip one house together. And then at the end of it, we'll see where we're at. And so when we, we both decided to go our own ways, there was no hard feelings. We're still good friends. Like, yeah, just manage those expectations up front because, um, you know, I'm guilty of falling in love very quickly and I'm like, <laughs> let's get married and forever and ever. But yeah, you're right. You have to sort of take a step back and say, Hey, you know, it may not be all roses at the end of this. Um, so let's, let's, let's take it, you know, one step at a time. So that's great. So you, so you knock that one out. And you got that check, which is a wonderful feeling um, mm -hmm. that, wow, I did it. It worked. So how did you get to over 60 houses? How did that all start to develop? Because I'm sure you started to realize, holy crap, I need to build a team and systems and processes. And you're very yeah. analytical. So I'm sure that came a little easier for you than me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was like, um, so my daughter was born in 2013. And 
I didn't really start going down that road te teams and systems until 2016 or so. Like it was, it's very much like a train leaving a station and building up speed. Right. Um, after I did one house, I said, cool, let's just do another. And I think the whole first like year, year and a half, it was just that like do a house, find another. Um, so I did three houses my first 12 months and then I did six houses my next 12 months. Um, and that was when I really was kind of like, okay, I've done nine projects. I feel competent in what I am doing. Um, what would it be like if I did two projects at a time? Like, what would it be like if, if I could do 12 projects the next year? And that was really the start of my growth. So then, um, we did like, you know, so three, six, 12, and then after that, it was like exponential growth, like 40 deals, 50 deals, um, which in itself is like a whole other story for another time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could dedicate one episode to mm -hmm. that growth. Yeah. Um, and that was when I, when I started doing 12, the, the decision to do 12 rehabs in one year necessitated a bunch of things. Like the, I hired an assistant. That was my first person. Actually, my first person was a bookkeeper. But, you know, they're like an hour or two a week. They're usually a service. The first like real employee I hired was an assistant to do the running around. Like, can you go meet this contractor? Can you put this lockbox on it? Can you go to Home Depot and get that thing? Put this sign in the yard. All those tasks that didn't really require brain power and logistics just required boots on the ground. How did you find, because that, that's a struggle for most people that I notice when we go through our net, local networks is they're like, you know, I always often highlight that, that you need an assistant. It sounds like you're ready. Um, how do, how would you recommend people find one? Cause you know, people are doing the virtual assistant stuff now, but I love the boots on the ground. So what would you recommend yeah. to people in finding one? Um, first, I think you have to have, I, at this point I've hired and fired, I feel like 20 people. <laughs> so there's a lot of lessons that I know now about hiring that I honestly think you have to learn the hard way, but I'll try and condense them. <laughs> yeah, please. The, the first thing is, um, somebody told me this past performance is indicative of future success. And so no matter what position you're hiring for, like dig into the thing that you want them to do and see if they have a history of doing that. Well, um, my assistant was my sister was the first person I hired, but I knew from her job role, like she had been for 15 years at that point, she'd been like an office administrator for a um, mechanic. And she basically ran his whole business, the back end of it, the billing, the receipts, running out and getting parts. Like she did all that stuff. So I knew that she would do well in this role. I, and I call her, I say, she was my point and shoot weapon. I'd be like, this needs done. She'd be like, cool, got it. You know, I think for an assistant, that's a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. To take action. I'm with you. I've gone through maybe half a dozen and um, I've been lucky enough that it's not, it's not that many. But the ones that work out the best are the ones who are proactive, like they get it and then they do stuff before you even ask, like they can read your mind and you're like, oh my God, you know, thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah, that's, that's critical. Um, one of the things I found in, uh, sourcing or identifying people that can help or be a part of the team is going to the local networks and getting in front of the room. There's, here's what I always recommend. Cause we run a, a meetup, uh, has a thousand members. You know, you know, South Jersey real estate investors. And um, we get about 50 to 70 per uh, our meeting in Princeton. <clears throat> and I, we give the crowd an opportunity with the microphone. What is it you're looking for, right? And Chad does this really well in his meetings too. And what I do after that, and recently I'm starting to point out to them is, you have to take advantage of that. Like, when are you going to be able to speak to 50, 60, 100 people at once? and tell everyone in the room what the heck you're trying to do and how you can help them. Um, and now it, it's starting to resonate. But when I, I do that often, like whenever you get to go to a meeting or it's your own meetup, get in front of the room and say, this is what I'm looking for. And, um, you know, reach, reach out to me after the meeting. Um, oh, nice. Maybe we will. I, so I run a meetup with Chad, so I'm going to we'll make sure we do that next time. We always ask it in a generic way, like who has something they want to share, who has something, but, but people rarely volunteer. I love to like, at least get four or five people say, tell me specifically, what's the thing you need? I bet somebody in this room has access to it. 
Hello, this is Josh McCowan, CEO of Viva May Hospitality and the beautiful Renault Resort Winery. I have to tell you, the secret's out. And the secret is On Air Brands. On Air Brands Creative Agency, which specializes in launching podcasts, transforming live events into live streaming events, and social media marketing soup to nuts. On Air Brands has changed the game. There'll never be a day from here forward when you and I and our companies don't need to be on the air. Every brand needs to be on the air, but so few know that. So it's great to work with a group that are ahead of the curve and to find a company that has been built on the core foundation of the future of marketing. If you're ready to broadcast your brand like they've done for my brands, take the next step and make a change that can transform your business, reach out to On Air Brands today. That's onairbrands.com. Yes, onairbrands.com. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, it's just encouraging them. You know, everybody's, you know, isn't that the second most feared thing in life, like public speaking Yeah. Like next to death? <laughs> I love that Jerry Seinfeld bit. You, you remember that one where he says, you know, the, the number one fear is death and the number two is public speaking. So it means the guy who's giving the eulogy would rather be in the casket. Or the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do my Seinfeld impression, but anyway. Um, so, okay. So you started to rehab more. You started, I'm imagining you are wholesaling at the same time because you had so many opportunities at this point, because you're probably known as the one who can close, the one who can get the job done. So uh, your part, the part of the business now, what would you say percentage wise is flipping versus wholesaling and buying holds? So that is a, that's an interesting story in itself. I went on this journey uh, and last year I basically realized what I was really good at and what I didn't like doing. And I made the decision to move to those things. Um, so when I started scaling my rehabbing, the problem was, and I'm sure a lot of the rehabbers listening are like, when you're looking to find a, a deal every month or more, that becomes your whole job. And in reality, you have to be managing your contractors <laughs> too. Like you can't just let them run amok. Um, so I realized I needed, something had to change. So I had joined this uh, mastermind seven figure flipping in early 2016. And I thought at the time I had just made the decision to do 12 houses. And I was like, cool, a flipping mastermind is going to be the place to be. Well, I'm, I show up and it's actually 80% wholesalers uh, at, the, at the time. Now it's like 50-50. But the cool thing was I went into that mastermind with these preconceived notions of what wholesalers were and what they did. And generally, I just thought they were sleaze bags. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, because it's the lowest barrier to entry. Yeah. So, yeah. So you do get a lot of people that don't know what they're doing. Yeah. And, and actually, now that you say that, that's probably why in this room, the people who are there were very like servant leader conscientious, just good, wholesome, decent people. And I think it's now it's because they were doing it at scale. They, they were all business owners, not just the entry level people. So maybe that it speaks to it. Um, so after sitting in the room with these guys, uh, I think two times I said, you know, maybe I should do my own marketing, help me find my deals. And if I get extra, I'll wholesale them on the side. Uh, and that was kind of where that journey began. And then I started doing it and I got some traction and I thought, cool, I'll build out these both sides. And what honestly what happened is I got spread too thin. I was trying to do too much and something had to give. Uh, and so I, at the same time, while this was all happening, I realized that wholesaling is like a marketing and a sales business and rehabbing is a construction business. It's a project management business. So that that's my other like hard one lesson that I would, challenge people. If you're getting into real estate investing, really think about which of those two things resonates with you. Do you, do you resonate more with construction and project management or do you, does marketing and sales typically sales seem like your cup of tea? Yeah. I love it. Oh, you're so good because, um, often people do not realize wholesaling is all about basically uh, the numbers and reaching more people and getting the word out there that this is what you do and this is how you can help. And, talking to more and more people to, to fill your pipeline. So let's get into this because this is the perfect segue to your company, which is Market Shark. So mm -hmm. how did you eventually realize that, okay, I'm doing this as a necessity for my business. Oh my God, I just created a new business. When, <laughs> when was that aha? <laughs> it, what actually happened, I never had the aha. What happened was 
uh, a good friend of mine who was really good at the sales side of wholesaling. This is what happens. If you're really good at sales and you're a wholesaler, you just throw more money at marketing. Like you pay no attention to your numbers, your KPIs, your metrics. You're like, just get me in front of more people and I will make more money, which is totally true. However, I was the opposite side. I was really good at the marketing and not the sales piece of it. And so I actually was, I had reached out to this person and I was like, can you help me with the sales side of things? Like I'm struggling there. And he said, sure, if you help me with my marketing metrics. And that was how it's really started. And he was like, he basically said, look, you're really good at this. We were able to save him. We cut his marketing costs almost in half. And he was getting the same responses. And so he was like, you're really good at this. And so he kind of talked me up to somebody else and somebody else came in and said like, I'd love to pay you to consult for me. And then, you know, that's, so my clients tend to be the people who are really good at sales, who are running a business at scale and like metrics, marketing, backend stuff is, they just have no desire <laughs> to pay yeah. attention to that. That's, um, that's such a great, uh, service to to give to the community especially in real estate uh because they they tend to not treat it as seriously as you're saying that we need to because you know i, I used to do it myself with uh yellow, yellow letters and postcards and all that stuff and it is it's a grind and you have to be consistent and think long term and I still get calls from letters that I've sent three years ago. Um, yeah. So it's it's amazing and it works. But what are some of the tools and tips that you have for people to, you know, like obviously stay consistent, you know, and trust the process. But are there other things that you could tell people that would help them in their marketing for, for deals? Well, I mean, there's a couple things like the first thing I tell people is to work backwards and really consider how much money you have to spend to do the number of deals that you want to do. So if somebody comes to me and they're like, I want to do four deals a month and I'm like, cool, how much money do you have to spend on marketing? And they're like a thousand bucks. And I'm like, okay, you can do that. But how much time do you have to spend? Because it's, it's either going to be money or time. Right. And they're like, well, I don't have a lot of time. I, I know from looking at people's data across uh, the U S that like typically people spend anywhere from 3000 to $5,000 to get a contract right now, if, if you're doing multiple contracts a month. So if you want to do four deals a month, even at the low end, you're looking at $12,000 in marketing on conventional channels. So that's like, that's kind of the starting place we go to. Um, and, and then we back it down from there. Um, and then the other thing I say is like, you, you need to track, you should always be tracking your stuff. Like you can set things up to track and not pay attention to it till later. That's how I started. Um, until you get to the point where you can do it. But like you should have separate phone numbers for every piece of marketing you do, right? Like that's how you know that somebody called you from a letter three years ago, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's um, nuts. Yeah. So I know you have some other stuff there. No, I mean, so that's so like separate numbers, separate ways to track every channel that you're putting out there. Then you have to have some sort of bookkeeping. And this is where I think a lot of people fall down is they just will, they'll spend money and they'll be like, that was on marketing. It's like, okay, well, what was that your direct mail? Was that your pay-per-click? Like you have to break it down by channel. And then on the back end, knowing where your contracts came from, if you're doing multiple channels. So you can take those three pieces of information and figure out how many, you know, how much money did it cost in that channel to get my phone to ring? How much money did it cost me to get an appointment? Oh, by the way, if you know how much money it costs you to get an appointment, let's say it's like 300 or $400 in marketing. Every time you cancel an appointment, just imagine you just lit $300 on fire <laughs> <laughs> because right. you didn't feel like going that day. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh my goodness. So um, I I'm familiar with some of your goals um, on cost per contract. So wh where are you at now and what, what has that goal changed? Um, well, when I first started tracking my metrics, um, I was at like, I wish I had, I actually just put together the chart, but basically over an 18 month period, we were able to increase our ROI um, by about, I want to say 70%, 70 cents, which uh, actually I can use an example of one of my clients. Um, last year, we just did a 2019 review on, on his data and the increase in ROI was like 80 cents and he was spending 170 some, he spent 170 some thousand dollars in marketing last year. So if you can get 80 cents more efficiency on that 170 some thousand, he basically made an extra $140,000. Wow. Wow. And, 
like, that's what I always say to people is like, if you would pay attention to this stuff, even if you can get your costs from 6,000 to $5,000 a month, what would you do with that extra thousand dollars? Like, where would you put that in your business? Maybe you could hire that admin or I don't know, call answering service or something, right? What would you do, Eric? What would you do with an extra thousand bucks in your business every month? Oh, geez. Um, I'd probably give a few raises to some of my rock star staff just because they deserve it and I don't pay anyone enough. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I highly recommend anyone listening, if you have a staff, pay them way more than, than they're worth. And um, I mean, my, my folks are loyal to, to, you know, all ends with that, with, with not making what they could make out in the market. Um, <laughs> so it's just that. And then also, yeah, marketing. It's funny, Becca, and I'll admit this since we are, uh, we are a marketing company as well, but you know, in a different space, mm -hmm. um, but we love organic reach. It takes longer, mm -hmm. um, but we haven't uh, put or invested a ton of money into back end. Um, because it's different for us, you know, Google ads and well, you, you do that, I'm sure, but uh, like Facebook ads and all that and testing and A-B testing. And so how much of your, because I'm really interested in the marketing aspect of the, the traditional side of things, you know, banded signs and yellow letters versus the new digital age. So how do you balance that? And what do you still feel is relevant? Well, I, I think it's super interesting because I, I, I tell people to ask themselves two questions. Do I have more time or money? And then do I live in a more rural area or more urban area? Because an interesting thing that I've noticed is that, you know this in marketing, right? You're trying to get inside the head of the person who you're marketing to. So you really have to think about who that person is. And in a more urban area, they tend to be super busy. They're on their phones a lot. They're not really engaging with the people around them. They don't want to, they don't need to. Um, and so in those areas, I think texting, cold calling, um, PPC, SEO, like I think the more digital stuff works better. Uh, whereas in more rural areas, those people, especially where I live, like rural Pennsylvania, people here, they've lived here for 30 or 40 years. They don't like outsiders. They are, they're just a little distrustful. They're skeptical. This is also like Northern, right? This is not the South. <laughs> So bandit signs surprisingly worked really well for me. Um, and I think when I was trying to figure out why, I think the reason is that if, if you see a sign on a random back road in Bum, Bumville, you know, Pennsylvania, <laughs> <laughs> almost family, uh, family show, <laughs> family show. <laughs> you, you feel like th that person must be local. They must have come here and like put it out. There's this, uh, I think associated they're from around here. Therefore I can trust them. So. Yeah. I love that. I, and I remember when I used to be much heavier into this side of things, <clears throat> I always made sure that all of our numbers were local. So I, I noticed some wholesalers would get Google numbers or whatever it is. And their number would be like Ohio when they lived in Pennsylvania or New Jersey. I'm like, what are you doing? No one's going to want to yeah. call you. Your number's from out of state. So, I mean, that's a little attention to detail. Uh, yeah. So uh, another thing I imagine, do you do something like um, on these banded signs, do you put a personal name like Reach Becca at Market Shark, you know, like, or do you do a generic info um, at? I, we personally would do just a call to action instead of like we buy houses, we would put like sell us your house, right? And then we put a little call or text. Um, I know people who are like Jenny buys houses and Leslie are like, they'll put their kids' names on it. Uh, I do think that that, I, I think that would work well. Yeah, so. yeah. I think it's effective, to, especially to the audience you're saying that's in the more rural area. It seems more trustworthy just subconsciously. And like, oh, Becca sounds like a really nice name and I'll talk to her. And then, you know, it, oh, yeah. It, it See, works. And female names like, pull way better, whether it's on signs or if you're texting or if you're cold calling, like female voices, female names, they're less threatening. People don't feel as imposed upon. Yeah. There's a name that we use on our marketing for Facebook uh, messenger. I want to say it's Ashley. I forget. It converts really well, this name. And uh, I heard a story. This wasn't us, but I'll borrow the story as if it's ours. But um, <laughs> we, <laughs> they had a client where someone came in and said, um, where's Ashley? She's amazing. And, um, you know, we've been going back, but it was all a bot. It was all back and forth through oh, me man. Facebook Messenger. 
And the bot was built so well that they they were convinced this was a person. And they're like, oh, how do we explain this is not a real person to them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ashley works in the way, way back office in the computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's she, <laughs> she's not here today. <laughs> oh my goodness! But yeah, it's it's pretty wild. Um, being in the space, especially in marketing, like you said, you're getting in the head of the buyer or the seller, and um, it, at times it feels manipulative. But what's what it's doing, you have to tell yourself or remind yourself that it's really ultimately helping someone. Because if you have a genuine heart and 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 you really truly want to help people, and you know, I, I love this saying that I heard recently. A friend of mine say, um, "Commission breath." Like if they don't smell commission breath uh, from you and they know you're for real, you'll get the sale, right? Because you, you you know yeah. you, you sit across the dinner table from someone who's really in in, in <laughs> need of your services because they you know they need to leave the house. It's under foreclosure, whatever it is. And if you, I've literally sat down for three hours with individuals mm -hmm. listening to their stories because I really just wanted to help. And, and that's why the podcasting is great, uh, right? It's a great channel mm -hmm. and uh, platform because I love to listen. But um, so Becca, I don't want to take too much more of your time and you're a wealth of knowledge. I, I want to... Um, I want to figure out how we can tap into your services because we need it. My network needs it and, uh, <laughs> and the audience needs it. So tell people the best way to reach you. Well, I um, marketshark.net is uh, for my consulting company. We typically work with like higher level clients. You have to be doing a couple channels for us to really be able to help you um, dial it in. Typically people spend around 10,000 or more a month in their marketing. Um, and then I also am a part, I, I just took a role recently as membership development with seven figure flipping, which is a mastermind. So if you're kind of at that part in your journey where you feel like you've hit a ceiling and you want to break through, um, you can email me at Becca at seven figure Um, but we're finding me on Facebook or TikTok. I've just discovered TikTok recently. <laughs> and it is glorious. <laughs> so what are you doing on TikTok? Please, uh, educate me. Cause I, I have an account, but I don't do anything on it. What do you I do? I make dancers, <gasps> obviously. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's completely not for work at all. Yeah, just... yeah. What's brilliant about it though, is you know eventually we're gonna crack mm -hmm. the code and figure out how to leverage it for business. And you're gonna already have a history <laughs> of content on there of you singing and dancing. <laughs> I don't know, Gary Vee's using it and he's doing something with it that looks does business like. Does he dance? I, I, I think he does, I don't know what he does, but they're, they're, they're all figuring it out. And I, I do recommend people test drive things, right? Mm -hmm. And if it works, yeah. it works. You gotta give it some time. Um, so Becca, what is on the horizon for you? What are, you know, let's, let's manifest and pull the people in that can help you achieve what it is you're trying to do this year and the near future. Oh, well, so I, I just took over, um, the membership development role within seven figure flipping. I've been a part of this mastermind for four years and, um, my, one of my great friends, who's actually my roommate in flight school, Bill Allen, he took over the, um, he bought the, he was a COO of it for uh, I think a year and a half. And then he bought it last year and he asked me to come on board and, and help basically love on the members, but help them meet their goals. Cause I mean, Eric, you've been in this business for a while. When you go to scale, number one, there's like a barrier you, that, that you hit just like the knowledge barrier. Um, and then number two, I don't know if it has to be this way, but I've seen it happen this way multiple times where you scale, you kind of hit your limit. You don't know what your limit is. So you hit your limit and it hurts you. <laughs> and then you have to go back and take your lessons and figure out how do you push through that next ceiling that you've hit. So that's my big focus right now is like, how do I help as many other real estate investors become successful um, and maybe shortcut some of the lessons that I had to learn the hard way, I'm hoping. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, I really have the best job in the world right now. It is to love on people and help them re reach their goals, which I think naturally inherently I'm, I'm kind of a coach type person. So. Yeah. Yeah. I see it. I feel it. Absolutely. How many members do you have? Uh, I think we have like 180. There's two different groups. It's kind of like the just beginning group, uh, people who've never done you know, zero to five deals. And then there's the higher level group of people who are making like 200, 250 a year. They're doing more than like eight deals and they're looking to scale. Six so. figure flipping mastermind. <laughs> uh, we call them runway and altitude because Bill's a pilot. We met in flight school, uh, so um, I we love just it. started it. But yeah, the, the runway is like 
let's get you going and off the ground and then altitude's like, all right, you're up in the sky, let's dial it in. Wow, yeah. You seem like a marketer. You're like how you come up with these things? <laughs> I didn't come up with that. I just I just wrote ride the coattails, which is funny is like um I found that in marketing, there are two types of people. And I realize we're probably at the end of this podcast, but <laughs> like there are artists and analysts. That's how I see it. The artists are like, here's the shiny new thing. It's so beautiful. Like we should try this new channel. It's amazing. I'm more on the analyst side, which is like, does it work? Like, I don't even, I don't care what you do. I mean, let's come up with some ideas, but like, let's, let's do it consistently and see if it works. Um, I'm much more of an action, action execution person. Yeah. Yeah. That, no, that's perfect. I love that because, um, often people, I think your side of things, you know, the more analytical side of marketers are way more powerful than the, the artists creative types, because, um, it's just, it's more in your lane. It's more of your strength, your superpower. Um, and I find that I struggle with that side of things. So I'm definitely sort of the artist marketer where I love the front end. You see, you know, yeah. I love the, I love yeah. branding and I love creating stuff that people want to engage with. Cause you know, it looks like something they want to consume, but, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. And if, you can, if you can marry those two together, if you either have both traits or if you can partner up with someone who has the your complimentary trait. I mean, that's where the magic happens because you got to have both sides. A hundred percent. And I found that um, when I do partner with someone that's such as yourself, yeah, we, we make magic happen because we start to help larger and bigger clients and corporations because um, they see what we do and they'll go, oh, that's great. But what's the ROI on that? And it's, yeah. always, it's difficult for us to answer that because, um, you know, I, I, here's my answer to that, Becca, is usually, um, how do you gauge the ROI on having Robert Kiyosaki on one of your podcasts and what that does for credibility? Like, that's mm -hmm. huge, right? That's something that's evergreen. Like, that's something that people often, you know, come up to me and say, how did you do this? Or how did you get that? And I, I can't gauge that, yeah. you know, it's difficult. Well, now I'm going to have to think about this. How do you gauge that? Because there is, there is a definite uh, advantage to having that, right? I mean, I heard right Robert Kiyosaki on uh, your podcast. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I was like Dang. <laughs> yeah, it's great, right? I mean, and I, I when he did the soundbite, I, I literally cried when he said my the, <laughs> my words, my name came out of his mouth. This guy who changed my life and all of our lives, um, and I was like, wow, this is really bizarre and surreal. But that I was like, that's going on every single show from here till the end of time. Um, yeah, and I often get a lot of comments about it, and and people they get it. They're like, oh, I must. I'm, if Kiyosaki's, uh, you know, recommending this guy, then I I trust. I trust what he's doing. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. But um, Becca, thank you so so much. Really, truly, um, I love having a much longer, deeper conversation because um, we we were talking a lot about you creating other shows, which you know, hopefully we can help you with. But um. Yeah. Best of luck on all of the stuff you're doing. I'm looking forward to seeing you again at uh, our next Real Estate Hackers Conference. Yeah, and come to the Real Estate Hackers Conference. And I wanted to say for veterans, actually, we just um, we're doing this nonprofit veterans real estate investing conference in May. It's called Veterans REI Live. So if you're a vet listening to this and this resonated with you and you're thinking about getting into real estate, um, check it out. Yeah. Awesome. We're going to put that in the show notes for anyone who may have missed it. But uh, thank you so much again, Becca. And um, we'll talk soon. All right. Thanks. That's it for now, folks. If you'd like to stay in touch with the show, you can contact me directly at eric at onairbrands.com. That's eric, E-R-I-K at onairbrands.com. And if you aren't already subscribed to the show, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, or any other podcast platform. And please recommend us to one or two people in your circle. That will go a long, long way to growing our community. Also, if you could rate us on iTunes, just take a moment uh, to give us five stars. And if they have more stars, give all of them. We'd greatly appreciate you for that. And always, always like, subscribe, and share, share, share this show on social media. We'd love you for that as well. And if you have any ideas or want to hear something on a future show, please hit us up. Maybe you have a question for one of my guests or you want to uh, tell a story, a success story. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. You can do that, especially if you're on the Anchor platform. You can leave us a voice message. We'd love to incorporate you and your voice on a future episode. Once again, folks, thanks again for listening to the Entrepreneur Circle. Please like, subscribe, and share share, share, share. I am Eric Cabral. And as always, remember, your network 
is your net worth. So get in the circle. Mm-hmm.